Welcome, ladies and gents. Chris Andre here. You can find me at Pet Boxing for boxing related tweets. Or you can subscribe to the channel and click that notifications button and get a new notification whenever a new video is uploaded. Let's talk boxing. We're going to try something different here. Um, this is primarily an audio. I've put a little camera visual visual up of me so you'll see me slightly delayed when I'm talking but the main focus here will be on the slides okay something very different to what we've done before um, but bear with me and let me know if you like it so we're going to talk about Lawrence Okoli against Christoph Glavatsky terrific fight step up fight for Lawrence Okoli it's one I'm very very fascinated about now before we go into some of the slides we're not going to do slides for everything but we're going to talk about a few different things specific things that I believe to be quite important aspects of how I think this fight could go. First and foremost, a collie, very tall, very rangy, reminds me a little bit of Vladimir Klitschko, not in terms of skill set, but in terms of his thought process. What Vladimir Klitschko would often do traditionally is make you work, earn your entry. He would be happy to just punish you from range, make it a boring fight if necessary, as long as he gets that W. While Lawrence Okoli is also that sort of guy, and we saw him do it against Chamberlain, we saw him doing it, get, doing it against Matty Askin. He's more than happy, Lawrence, to tie you up, make it a non-event, if it means he wins the fight. And so that's drawn a lot of criticism from fans who consider him to be boring and stuff like that. If you leave all that aside, we're just talking about him as an obstacle, how to overcome this obstacle. He's a massive obstacle to overcome. He's a very difficult fighter to beat. And unlike Vladimir Klitschko, he's not as skilled as Vladimir at range. He makes some errors, and we'll talk about that. But one of the things he does, which is, you know, better than Vlad, pound for pound, is his ability to destroy you on the inside. Vladimir was happy to tie you up. Whereas what Lawrence tends to do is tie you up and stop you from fighting. But he's implemented his own destructive work within that frame. And that, that, and that makes him a very dangerous guy. So we're going to talk a little bit about him. First and foremost, one of the things he does, which I'm not going to show you slides on, you know, I'm sure you, you can just take my word for it. He's very, very good at being very defensively responsible and landing something quick and getting out. So as he's at range, if he ducks down to throw a jab to the body, just come down for a jab to the solar plexus, he'll land the jab and pull out very, very quickly with a hop back too. So he maintains that range quickly. He'll come in, land, get out quick. He's not there for you to counter. He really makes you earn your entry point. When you then do get on the inside, let's look at some of the high level stuff that this guy is capable of doing. And then we'll talk about Christoph Glavatsky too. So if I can get this thing working, <laughs> here we go. Look at that, curtains opening. See the high level production I'm bringing you now. <laughs> so let's talk about this. So what you see here is a clinch on the inside. He's very defensively responsible. He has his left hand inside the guard of Wadi Camacho. This is something he wants to do constantly. Andre Ward is often very good at doing this too. He's defensively responsible here and he's in a very safe environment. When Wadi pulls his hand back though to throw the hook, look how Okoli follows his lead hand with his own right hand just above the elbow where the bicep is. Now, if you were to watch, I mean, there's a martial artist, for instance, who does self-defense stuff. He's done some Krav Maga stuff. His name is Nick Drossos. And what Nick Drossos has done is he does self-defense sort of videos on YouTube. And he often talks about how to trap a knife if you, God forbid, you're ever having to face a knife attack. Now, as he says, and it's the same thing I'm saying, if you ever have to face a guy with a knife, the best thing you can do if you've got some space between you is run away. However, if you're forced to fight, he explains how to trap a hand and manipulate a guy's arm in this scenario. Well, what you're seeing here is Lawrence Okoli manipulating the arm of Wadi Camacho. He's pinning him, essentially, not quite a pin, but preventing the trajectory for that shot to come about. So Wadi gives up. He realizes it's not there. And as you can see, he gives up trying to land it. They're still in a situation where it's a bit of a stalemate here. They're both safe. Neither guy can affect the other guy. So what happens? Waddy tries again. I want to create that space to throw a hook to the ribs. He's open there, right? Okoli, being very physically strong, follows that arm with the hand to the bicep. He's manipulating his body control. He's not giving him the space to work. When he gives up, eventually, he then 
comes and gl uh, grasps the head of a collie. So from this position, you can see a collie's arm. It comes back. He's looking a collie now to throw a right hook. And he manages to land. Nothing major, but just to show you how he stops Camacho from being able to get off his own shots, even if he didn't land anything significant, he himself, he was able to cut the problem off at the source by literally controlling his arm. Now we move to another scenario whereby a collie, although he's very good on the outside, I want to talk to you about an error that he makes and then we'll come back to being on the inside. One of the things that a collie often does, not often, but one thing he can do, when he throws the right hand and he twists the pivot of the toe, you can't see it because the referee's here in this particular shot, but you can see it on the pads, for instance, if you go back and watch him work on the pads in the build-up to this, IFL, I've got a couple of videos out there where he's been working on the pads in the build-up to this fight a couple of days ago. Um, you'll see that he twists his foot, his back foot, so much that he almost falls inwards. And it can be a little bit of a, there's a lot of power there, but a little bit of an over committing, so to speak, in the right hand. And it can look a little bit wild. And here against Wadi Camacho, what you see is that he throws a right hand from an area he shouldn't throw the right hand. He had no right to throw it. He was far too far out. We'll go back to it and have a little look. He falls short. He realizes, now I'm in trouble. I've fallen way too short. But this is the reason I'm showing you this clip is to show you how he can be defensively responsible even when he makes an error. He instantly realizes the error that he's made. He ducks so low that it's actually an illegal move. It's below the waist. But... Who's going to say anything to him, right? What's the ref going to say? Don't dip below the... You'd rather that being told off than, you know, eating a left hook's flush. The point is he's made an error and the immediate thought process was not, oh no, how can I recover to throw a, another shot? It was, whoa, safety first. He gets so low, he comes under the hook of Camacho, but he's so low now that if he's going to then throw anything in return, you can see that, Camacho is going to see it coming. It's telegraphed. He has to come all the way from low to throw the hook. Camacho comes under it. So now they're back in a clinch. So even when there was the sloppiness there at range, and he's not always sloppy at range, just sometimes he can be a little bit overexcited, shall we say. And we'll show you some more clips of that later on when he's looking to initiate the attack when he's moving forward. We'll get to that later. But they're back in the clinch. And from here, you can see he's looking to create space that left hand across the chest. Okay, he's got that forearm across the chest. He's looking to find that space. Now, what you see here, that forearm then immediately moves up to the jaw of Camacho. Back to that head control using that forearm. And if you can see from the second clip, there's two clips in one slide here, obviously. As you can see from the one on the right-hand side, I've pointed at two arrows. Look how his left foot has come behind the foot of Wadi Camacho. So he's, Camacho is now square on. You can see the bending of the ropes. So he's leaning back on the ropes. He hasn't got the leverage to do anything. He's being held down from the chest with that left hand. And he's got his foot behind Camacho. He's in a very favorable position. This is not where Camacho wants to be. However, perhaps it's telegraphed what he's trying to do here because Camacho reacts very quickly and it's only a glance and show he gets underneath it. He's not really affected by it. And then he steps out. And as he's stepping out, you can see there's potentially something open here potentially a left hand to the body, but he stepped out in such a, a, a big way, such an exaggerated way, coming out quickly, focusing on how to get out safely, that there's quite a distance here to land that left shot. Whereas when it comes to the jab, he throws up that arm and he cuts it off. So he's very defensively responsible when he's in the clinch. He's the one dictating the clinch. Even if he doesn't land his shots, he's never in danger of shots being landed in return. Look at that little vortex change there. See the things I do for you? This is Hollywood level stuff, man. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to Christoph Glavatsky. Christoph Glavatsky, and I will come back to a colleague, but what Christoph Glavatsky likes to do is lean away. Okay, let me just give you more of myself to see for a second. He's leaning away and he's got his foot, which I'll show you in a second, as a barrier, and he's luring you in. He's not standing upright. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. If he was standing upright, so let's say his head was here where the mouse is in line with his glove, he would be in range now. But he's not doing that. He wants to force you to come to him when he's in a defensive posture. You can see it again here a lot more clearly. Can you see how his foot's further ahead of him? Almost like a shield. You can't just run through that foot, right? And Vlasov can't quite get close. It's hard to reach that. You've got to be willing to come inside and go to war. He doesn't want to have a jabbing match against a superior boxer. 
Again, you see it here. He's baiting you in. Come on, come close to me if you want. And you can see that he's in a defensively responsible position. He's pretty much covered up. And he's sitting there and he's saying, okay, come to me. I'm not going to stand up straight. We're not going to have a straight up boxing match. You come to me. Very wide stance. Again, from the angle over the shoulder of Lassov, just to give you a sort of idea of what he sees, there isn't that much there to aim for. And finally, you can see it again there. But what I want you to see here from this particular clip, actually, no, sorry. So from there, he can shoot that jab up. If you come too close, he'll fend you off with the jab. But from there, here we are. Here's an example of when Vlasov does try to close the range. He's waiting for you to come in. He's looking for big, powerful shots. As he steps in, so it looks like he's going to engage him, right? That left arm comes up from Vlasov. Elbow comes up. He's looking to protect himself from that lead right hand of Glavatsky. Glavatsky immediately faints as though he's going to throw that hand. Barely anything on it. What he's really looking to do is throw the power hand, which comes down the middle. If you come into my space, that's what I'm going to do to you. So what you want to do against him, because he's got a wide stance, you want to come around him. You want to get over his lead right shoulder, past his lead right shoulder, to come to the side of him. So let me show you something that Vlasov does, which is brilliant here, that a colleague could learn from, but it's also a mistake. But the interesting thing is, it's a mistake for Vlasov. Is it a mistake for a colleague? Okay, this is what I want to talk about. You see how he's stepping on his foot? I've circled it here. That's to affect his mobility. That's probably done on purpose. Often you get this when you're seeing an orthodox fighter fight, fight a southpaw, but I believe he's doing it on purpose because he wants to stop him being mobile. Because one thing about Glavatsky, he does turn with you. If you try to go around over his shoulder, he'll turn with you. Maintain that stance. Okay, we're talking about when he's in a defensive posture. He does other things when he's on the front foot. We'll talk about that later. But in a defensive posture, he does turn with you and won't give up that space easily. So he's been stepped on now. In that second picture, you can see the moment he lifts off his foot, he's lifting it in order to engage an attack. It's going to be a jab. He throws that jab, as you can see here, to blind Glavatsky. And as you can see from his lead left foot, you see how it's come behind Glavatsky's lead left foot, lead right foot? He's now in an angle where he can throw that right hand. Glavatsky now realizes what's going on. He panics. So he tries to duck forward. He can't do anything else from there. Because of the way his, his weight is distributed, he can't just step away quickly and get out. He can't do that now. His stance is too wide. So what does he do? He ducks forward thinking if a straight right hand comes over the top, it will go over my head. Vlasov's aware of this, throws the right hand with a lower trajectory and lands it flush. What he should do now is either come totally around him, Lomachenko style, change the angle and come to the side of him to continue that attack or step out. You've won the exchange. But here's the error. What Vlasov does is get too greedy. And by getting too greedy, as you can see here, he throws another left hand, which misses. Now you're in the wheelhouse. This is what Glavatsky wants. He can't chase you around the ring. He's not as swift as you. He's not the boxer like you to have a stand-up technical fight. He wants war. Well, now you've come into his wheelhouse. And look at the vicious ferocity with which he throws that left shovel hook to the body. It's a low uppercut come hook, more of an uppercut. Here he lands it really below the belt line, to be honest with you. But it's a shot he loves to throw. He throws it all the time. And from there, I want you to look at the feet of Vlasov now. Now it's Vlasov that's square on. Look at his tiptoes. He's getting on his tiptoes. Let's change the slide. He tries to recover by grabbing his head, leaning on him. But that left hand still free because he's turned off at an angle. He's not square on, which makes him harder to tie up. This is something that Okoli is going to have to look out for. Now, could a, if this was Okoli instead of Vlasov, would that right hand have been on that bicep to cut off that shot? If it was, what we see here from Glavatsky is that he actually throws it upstairs. So while his hand's there, instead of trying to throw it low, he's changed the trajectory and thrown a looping shot over the top. And he lands. And look at the feet of Vlasov. One foot is completely off the floor. One is on his tiptoes. And as you can see from that last photo there, he's off balance. So where Vlasov was smart and initiated this opening, because he got too greedy and stayed in the wheelhouse too long, Glavatsky is able to bring chaos. He'll bring you 
to a scenario which was fairly similar to what you just saw Vlasov do. A collie this time his hands on the his lead foot's on the actually on the inside of the, the lead foot of Camacho. But he throws that jab low, and then as Camacho tries to duck, you see that right hand get thrown and land flush. So earlier I said he should have come around him. What you see here is a collie come inside. He doesn't go around him because the ropes are there. So he comes inside. But look at what a collie does. Because he's up against the ropes, look how he brings his hands above his head again, just like Vlasov did, but look at the right hand. See what I was talking about, about how the right hand's are there rather than holding his own. He's not clasping his own glove like it looked like Vlasov was doing. He's thinking about that left, hook, that left hand, that free left hand of Camacho. But he's also lent with him on his hips. He's using his pelvis to lean into him. You can see it more clearly here in the follow-up video. And his lead foot has come around the back as well of Camacho, as you can see here. But he is more square on. But he's pushing him back with his hips. He's thrusting him into the ropes. Don't get any ideas, you lot. But he's thrusting him onto the ropes. And you can see from his left hand as well, he's now also thinking about how do I hold the rope? He's using that stability. He's pinned Camacho. So... Is Camacho going to come back with anything to cause the sort of havoc that Glavatsky caused in that exchange against Vlasov? He doesn't manage to. He's not able to because as you can see here, Akoli leans on him. Look at that elbow in the back of the cervical spine. Similar to what Vlasov did, but he's bigger, he's heavier, Lawrence Akoli. And he's leaning in a manner whereby, because he's got that elbow on top of the cervical spine, it's not easy for him to free that left arm and throw that hook to the body, that uppercut to the body. And when he steps out, both hands are on his height, the side of his head. You see that? He's trying to exit there with control to stop Wadi Camacho being able to throw anything back. The question is, is he going to be able to be physically strong enough and astute enough when it comes to the angles to do these things to Glavatsky? I'm going to play the short clip slowly of the finish just to explain exactly what's going on here as you can see they're in the clinch and Okoli has his head hidden behind the head of Wadi Camacho it's over his shoulder and he can feel Wadi's right hand on his back and he can feel his left hand on his shoulder so he knows from this position he's safe prior to this in the clinch Okoli had just landed a couple of right hooks to the ribs so what Okoli is waiting for now is movement he wants that left that right hand to come off of his back because when that happens he realizes right Waddy is lining something up here. So let's play it and have a look. He still feels it on these ribs. Now the hand comes away. Immediately, Akoli knows. The minute that hand's come away, he raises that elbow. That acts as a shield to protect the side of his own, the left side of his own head, and he ducks down. The shot misses, just to protect himself. He's still in the clinch, still looking comfortable. He's aware of where both of Waddy's hands are. That little hook's nothing, but Akoli throws that right hand up anyway. Now Akoli's thinking about how am I going to start to, again, he does the same thing. He feels that hand move and ducks again. And he's starting to think, how do I create an angle where I can start to get my offense off while stopping his offense? Create a little bit of space to throw that right hook. His left hand is controlling the left hand of Waddy. When it releases, you see that arm bar come up to pr protect himself from that left hook. Just creates it like a shield, protects himself from being hit. He shifted his weight to the other foot now. Little left hook misses, but look how he's controlling the entire body of Camacho. See how he's holding his body almost like he's hugging him? Well, now he's hugging him. That left hand is free. Sorry, that left hand is not free of um, Waddy's, but the left hand of Okoli's is free. So now he launches down with a really hard left hook. Immediately when he lands that left hook, look at that right hand. See how that right hand has come back to the bicep of Waddy Camacho? He's looking to control Camacho, stop cutting off at the source the ability to throw that shot. It's blocked. That left hand was still measuring up. Did you see it? It was still on the jawline of Camacho. He only moved it in preparation for throwing that right hand. Lands flush. Camacho's felt that. He comes down. See that little hop step to stop him from smothering his work? Just to create that space to line up the left hand again. He could have fallen into him. Like I showed you before where he fell into him to control him on the ropes. No, this time he doesn't need to. He's felt that he's had an effect on Camacho. He wants to go for broke. He wants to go for the kill. So now he's created space. The left hand comes around, lands flush. Right hand flush. 
Camacho now is in a world of trouble. Another hook. This time it misses. Right hand to the body. Now he's hunting. Okay, and now we see Camacho's all over the place. Do you see that, though? Did you see how he pulled his head down with his right hand? Rewind that if you want. He missed that last shot, threw the right hand down to stabilize him, to control him, just to keep him still. He's looking for that shot. He lands, but Camacho's already done by then. But the point is here, he will use head control, shoulder control, Bicep control, arm control, he'll use anything he has to to manipulate the position of his opponent, to stop his opponent being able to escape, to stop his opponent from being able to defend himself, to cut off the angle for a trajectory of shot to come back at him. He's wrestling you. This is what makes Lawrence O'Colley so fantastic on the inside. I want to show you what I mean about Klavatsky trying to lure an opponent in. So... This is just after an exchange that Vlasov got the better of. He landed some good shots. Glavatsky did what he was doing throughout this fight, trying to throw that big, powerful, over-the-top left hand. Okay, lure him in. Let's try to go to war. Now, they're standing off against each other, as you can see here. And as we press play and see what's happening here, he shifts onto his back foot. Something we've just spoken about, that lean away that he likes to do. So, somewhat of a stalemate here. Here we go. Who's going to win this exchange? He takes that one step forward. You saw that, Glavatsky. He made it look as though he was coming in. Vlasov also dropping his hands, trying to lure him in. He doesn't actually come inside. He steps back out. You saw that little foot faint, right? Very exaggerated. Then he offers his head up. You see how he's bent his body forward? He said to Vlasov, go on, there's my head. Steps back out. And because it's a swinging pendulum motion, Vlasov thinks, right, there's a pattern there. He's going to swing forward again. As he does, he steps back. He's now in the wheelhouse of Glavatsky. This is where Glavatsky wants him. He rotated his left shoulder out immediately. That left hand, that's what he's wanting to bring into play all along. You've fallen for the bait. You've come into my wheelhouse. You didn't land. You're not in control. I'm now in control. Bang. That left hook to the body, which he loves to throw when he lures you in causes Vlasov to step back clearly has an effect you before how a colleague can sometimes throw that right hand and be a little bit off balance well Glavatsky does the same thing he's just thrown a left hand here and look at you can just see it behind the elbow here of Vlasov he's the it's come down in a downward trajectory the whole side of his face is visible he's also off balance here but look at what happens as we go along with this fight with this exchange he swings that, le that left leg back. So what he's had to do is reposition himself. Vlasov should have really been ready to punish him the moment he fought, fell short. Well, one thing we know about Akoli, his ability to be in and out quickly could mean that he could potentially punish Glavatsky if he falls short in that way. Will Glavatsky also be able to punish Akoli? I think we've seen so far, yes, he will be able to. But let's look further along here what happens. Steps back, throws a short jab. And lands Glavatsky. And you can see Vlasov also throws a jab, followed by a left hand. They're both glancing shots. This is the problem. When you don't land on Glavatsky, you're now in his wheelhouse. You're in that mid range area where he wants you. So a collie has to be accurate. And if he's not, he has to control his body like he did against Camacho. Because what happens, that left hand comes, doesn't even land flush. But he's so chaotic in the angles that he's able to drop Vlasov. Vlasov protests because it only clipped him and it was a balance issue, but it's still counted as a knockdown. You can see it here from above. Short jab. Lovely short jab there from Glavatsky. He's got his hand extended already. So there's not much to travel with. There's not much room to have to travel with. So he lands it. That causes, that blinding of Vlasov actually causes him to be inaccurate. Now he's in the wheelhouse. Look how close he is from above. Bang. He has to rotate his entire body. He's off balance now, Vlasov. But look at Klavatsky's position. And he has to rotate his entire body. It's enough to knock him down. And so he can cause chaos on the inside. If you're not doing what you need to be doing on the inside, he is capable of causing chaos. And this is what makes this so interesting. Is a collie stepping up to a level he's never been at before? going to be able to dictate the the bodily um, construct, the bodily construct 
of Glavatsky to stop him getting shots off? Or is Glavatsky going to be able to find the space to throw off those, whether they're low shovel hook left hands, left hands over the top, right hands over the top? Is he going to be able to create the sort of havoc inside where a colleague cannot dictate what is going on and cannot create the angles for himself? Because we've seen he can miss shots, but when he misses them, he's always controlling the opponent. Can he do it here? What if Akoli is the one that is on the back foot and Glavatsky is struggling to get on the inside? Is he going to be able to force his way in? Well, we've shown you by leaning back in the way that he does in this particular fight, he's also not giving up much to the taller fighter. The taller fighter to land when his head's all the way on the other side of the ring, practically, as I showed you earlier with the slides, you're creating a situation whereby to reach him, you have to come into his wheelhouse. That is what he offers you. He says, okay, you can hit me if you want, but come into my wheelhouse. So what Akoli has to do is be accurate when he's landing those shots early. He has to be accurate with them and then be defensively responsible, but understand angles as well. Don't stay in the pocket too long. Come around him if you have to, but don't be a sitting duck. If you find yourself falling into shots, make sure you fall all the way in affect his balance, grab his shoulders, grab his arm at the bicep, try and do whatever it is you can to throw off his ability to throw shots back at you, but be prepared because it's then going to get chaotic. And we know that Lawrence O'Colley is a very big man, very physically strong. I have no doubt about the fact that he's going to go on to become a heavyweight. He's a very big cruiserweight. He's huge and he's physically strong. But what if he can't keep Glavatsky from causing that havoc on the inside? That's when this fight becomes very, very interesting. Now, as you can see from this particular exchange, watch how Glavatsky against Usyk, who's a mover, so he's the one that's got to close the range more consistently, which he might have to do against Okoli, because Okoli is a taller man who might, as we said, box cautiously. This is a different type of cautious, but can you see how he lifted his back foot off the floor? And again, when he throws that back, that, that backhand, he lifts his back foot off the floor. That affects his balance. Watch his back foot. He does it quite often. And when he did, there were a few feints there, so he's not just bulldozing in like any crazy guy. But there you go. That one, he leaped into the shot. Now, when you commit like that, if you don't land and you fall short, two things happen. Number one, if you fall short, you're in a situation where you can get countered. You're in a situation where you're a sitting duck. It takes a moment to adjust after you've lost your positioning. Now, a colleague could look to really capitalize on that. If he maintains that range, keeps his range, he can, of course, make him fall short and then capitalize in that way. So in summary, what I expect to happen is a very, very interesting technical fight. I believe that Lawrence O'Colley will come out and will turn his shoulder and look to fight. He will also be leaning back and it will become a bit of a jabbing contest early on. This is how I expect the fight to, to, to really develop. Glavatsky looked very trim in the build up to this fight in the open workout. He was wearing a t-shirt, so I'm not so sure. He's been inactive since 2019. I think that will also play a role. But the fact that he's looked very trim suggests that he's going to be looking to try and close the range. He's assuming that Lawrence Okoli is going to be difficult to get to. And we saw in his last fight, Okoli, much like Glavatsky, also liked to have his lead foot quite forward out. He was a lot more fluid with his movement of his lead hand and then shooting that shot and getting back out, pulling back out. But he's making the opponent earn the, the right to get inside. And he's trying to line up that right hand. He's got it cocked. He's almost at this sort of angle. He's got it consistently cocked. And he's shooting that jab. And then he's looking to come through. And he, at the first time he did, he landed a body shot. And he dropped his opponent, who was no great shakes in the last fight. But the point is, I can imagine it being tentative early on. Glavatsky will then have to take risks. Where the fight will be decided, because... I can imagine Okoli being happy to just land four jabs if Glavatsky doesn't land anything, if it means he's winning the round. So Glavatsky, I believe, will start to take risks and start to launch in with those power shots. And he'll start falling into range. And I believe he'll start getting caught on his way in. So where the fight, I believe, will be decided are on two things. Number one, if he can avoid that right hand coming in as he tries to close the range. If he does and he gets inside, that's when the fight will become really interesting. Who wins the exchanges? Okoli, who looks to dictate and, cre and control his opponent. Or Glavatsky, who looks to bring chaos, which prevents you from being able to control anything. If you're asking me, at this stage of their careers, with the layoff that he's had as well, and the skills of Lawrence Okoli on the inside, something he doesn't get credit for. 
I expect Lawrence Okoli to control this fight and to win this fight by stoppage. I think he'll eventually get to Glavatsky. I can see Glavatsky falling short and eating some big, powerful shots. Um, between the rounds of like 7 and 10, that sort of period, I can imagine him getting to him. Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Thanks for watching. Take care. God bless. Oh, and let me know what you thought about this new little test. <laughs> Obviously, I'm doing all these little video clips, which, you know, in the little slides, you know, it, it is very time consuming because I'm technologically illiterate. But maybe I'll do something like this for Fury AJ moving forward. You know, some of the big fights. Let me know though, what you thought if you liked the, the look of it. Thanks for watching. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.